So we just got back from, or half of us just got back from our Hawaii trip, and uh, we really wish the other half of you guys could have come with us, but um, hopefully you guys were following along with the blog. I'd like you guys to check it out. We'll, I'll be looking at it, maybe cleaning up a few things uh, this week now that we're back. Um, but uh, it was a great trip, and we recorded just about everything, and, and so those experiences, even if we don't go back to Hawaii, or even if you guys couldn't come with us, you guys should be able to at least get a sense of what we saw. We started with, so this is Waikiki Beach. This is the beach when we first got there. Everybody walking in the water for the first time. So somebody want somebody might want to tell me a quick, uh, give us a quick overview about what Waikiki was like? This is everybody sleeping. <laughs> this is everybody sleeping on the beach because we didn't get a hotel room the first night. The sand was like powdered sugar. Soft. Yeah. What else? What, what, what about in the context of coastal management? What, what, what were the things that popped out of you guys from Waikiki Beach on the island of Oahu? Super developed. Super developed. Mm -hmm. yeah, imported sand. Imported sand. Yeah. So not the stuff that you see here, but for a long time they were importing sand from Manhattan Beach in Los Angeles to this to nourish this beach which seems a little crazy but that's what they were doing this current beach has been nourished by dredging some near water shoals or near island shoals of sand the sand management's an issue anything else really bright lights mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yep Right. A lot of trash. Was there a lot of trash, you guys? No. There were a lot of trees. Yeah. All over, everywhere we walked, there was cigarette butts, but not really on the beach. Not really on the beach. So, so we didn't see this because we were we were on our way to the uh, tuna auction at the time. But guys from each hotel will go out in the morning and rake, and 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 so it's not it's not gr mechanical grooming like we're used to here in Southern California, but it's in most of these doors highly tourist areas where people expect to walk on and see a clean beach that will be hand uh, hand clean. Somebody's going to say something else before I interrupted you? They went to the fixed fish auction. These are all tuna that are being auctioned, right? So they, they've been cut up so that the bidders can look at the quality of the meat. And these guys are moving up and down. This is a, this is a, a cadre of, of guys that are um, bidding on the fish. They buy, each fish is sold, and they're bidding on a price per pound. And, uh, and so, these guys, so that's what's going on there. Anybody else want to say anything about the fish auction we did? Quickly? So relatively small, right? This is the biggest one in the U.S. This is not the biggest one in the world by any means. That's in Tokyo, Japan. But, but this is this is the biggest in the continental U.S. or in the in the United States of America. There were several other species besides tuna and bycatch, but those were the ones with good quality fish. Right. So they had they had opa, they had mahi mahi, they had um, some billfish there as well. Although the targeted thing here is tuna. So that was the lion's share of the the fishery gets that. But and then there's some CO two can have a little contact with the fish. So um, uh, what this came up in the context of uh, we, we haven't yet started our our seafood surveys. We're gonna be doing that um, uh, soon but um, This is in the context of all the poke shops that are opening up, right? All those, it's like fast food now. It's like the <coughs> biggest trend the last couple of years in seafood retail, you know, uh, um, uh, restaurant sales. These little pop up, either pop up or just small poke shops. And um, the question came up here well, where, the, where does that tuna come from? It's almost all crap tuna. It's almost all from outside the U.S. Um, and uh, 
so we had we had some instruction on how you determine high quality tuna meat from from lower quality and so they're using low quality in there but what Andy's referring to is there's a way they can trick it and make it look like it's higher quality by gassing it essentially um, so the, the red color in So the red color you're seeing in here, um, it, one of the reasons why these fish are able to swim so much is that they're, 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 in, they're swimming machines. Tuna are swimming machines. They're an incredible, um, incredibly uh, fast and incredibly efficient at moving through the water. And so one of the ways they do that is they have, you and I have oxygen carrying hemoglobin in our blood and that moves around these guys have a lot of that in their muscle tissue. And so um, essentially uh, they can, when it gets bad or, or if they get so-called burn, if they, if they fight too hard, you can get browning of the, of the meat as opposed to redding of the meat. And so what Andy's talking about is they can take, this doesn't happen here, this is not in the US market, but the stuff in the sort of lower quality um, tuna places, uh, you can take it and you can gas it and because a lot of these molecules in here are designed to you know take up release oxygen carbon dioxide carbon dioxide um, you can trick it and, and so it looks fresher it looks pinker than it otherwise would be and if you had the raw if you start with the raw stuff it might be brownish color but by gassing it you can make it more pink like um, doesn't improve the taste but it visually looks more appealing so, yeah. Anything else about the fish auction? I have a question about that. Wasn't there something like it's not legal in the state, so people will take it out, gas it, and then ship it back, and that's like their loophole? Or uh, if it's low quality, they could. Yeah. I also noticed that they, uh, when we walked in through there, they had like a, uh, a foot bath almost for the anti issue. It was a foot bath. That's exactly what it was. Yeah. Yeah, so, so that, that's basically just, that's a decontamination thing. That's for any, any time you go into a food processing facility, they'll have you do that. Because one of the places we're most dirty is the bottom of our feet because we've maybe just been walking through who knows what. And so that's a, that's a standard food safety, food security practice. Uh, thankfully, everybody stepped through that except for Casey who decided, <laughs> oh, that big lump, that big square of liquid, I should probably jump over that. But... Everybody else, everybody else practice good food, food safety, food security. Um, cool. Then what else did we do? Then we got in a plane. We flew to the Big Island, where we stayed the rest of the time. And why don't you guys tell us what we did? Uh, did there? Let's see. for this fish pond have been going on for about a year and a half now and still a lot of work ahead of us but hopefully within time we'll have enough food to feed our local community in Chilcaha. So mahalo for visiting us today and uh, see you guys next weekend. Mahalo. So this is a fish pond. This is a traditional way that the one of the ways Polynesians obtain their food which is to create a, a coastal inlet or modify existing structures so that you, with a, with a great, let's see. So to the right is the ocean, behind us is the land. And so these guys are just doing a little cleanup project. So there's, there's slats here, right? And so what happens is the juvenile size class of fish can sw mullet, um, uh, can swim through this and get inside and eat insects and do all this kind of stuff in this um, brackish water. It's, it's mostly fresh. It's, it's, it's not, this particular one is not particularly salty. Do you guys remember what the parts per thousand was? At that point, I think it was eight. Yeah, eight, right. It was like seven, six, seven, eight. So it's not that salty, but 
just a little bit. It's mostly fresh. But still, these guys come in from the ocean, little babies, and there's all this great uh, vegetation and place for them to hide and all this and that. So they get bigger and bigger and fatter and fatter and bigger and bigger, and then they can't get out to the slats. So then when it's time to harvest, the traditional Polynesian harvest was just jump in the water and scoop out these fish, right? So minimum amount of work. Um, and th and that, that tradition has by and large been lost in the islands. And this is part of a, a group that, a, a larger growing effort to, to rekindle that, um, that stuff and rekindle those practices and return to a more perhaps sustainable way to harvest fish that ties in with history as well as um, fisheries management stuff. So we did that and we slept and then uh, in a hotel for a change. And then uh, the next day we hit, hit another, another fish pond um, and then we toured the, um, anybody, anybody want to say anything about the fish ponds? Uh, I think they were cooler than the ocean. Oh, te temperature wise? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where the heck am I? Uh, lots of poaching. So yeah. they wanted people, people breaking in, stealing stuff. Not really a lot of defense for them. Yeah. So these are these are just right next to the road, and you know it's an island. And so one of the problems they have, which many of our colleagues and projects have, is vandalism and or theft. And you know when it's something like a fish, it takes a long time to grow up. Right? It'd be just like if you're growing oranges. It takes a long time to get those oranges. And if somebody came and stole those oranges the week or two before you're about to harvest them, you'd be pretty ticked off. One of these ponds, the one I didn't show you yet, but you guys can look at it on the blog. Eight years since they've had a, a significant harvest because these guys keep coming in, stealing the fish, stealing the, once they get to you know, the good size, the, the big eaten size. So they put up security cameras and those have been stolen. And so it's 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 a challenge, but but they're working on it. They're working on it. <coughs> um, uh, so, so then we went to the Pacific. Uh, so this is this is a, a, a Pacific Aquaculture Research Center of the University of Hawaii, and these guys and so the students are looking at some of the different culturing uh, tanks here. We had a whole tour about. We work on ornamental fish as well as food fish as well as um, um, uh, oysters, a lot of oyster cultivation. So we learned about that. Um, what else did we do that day? We uh, yeah, so we did that kind of stuff. Oh, then we went to the night market. So this is basically a farmer's market. Um, where there's music and food and stuff and all these uh, folks come one night a week and it's sort of like a big kind of town party type thing. So everybody hung out. And anybody want to say anything about the night market? It was cash only, yeah. I was glad to see that because that makes me, you know, encourage. I'm sure some of the business in there will probably be paying, like, you know. I think some of the jewelers and people yeah. can take a credit card. Uh, so cool, yeah, okay, good, yeah, great. Yeah, it wasn't just quote unquote Hawaiian food. It was it was sort of Hawaiian, Southeast Asian kind of stuff. So one of, one of the interesting things uh, that seems to be happening in Hawaii, which is a little bit maybe slightly different from the trend around the world, which is interesting, is um, and someone mentioned this, uh, our a gentleman from the tourism board mentioned this, which was interesting. I thought. We've seen a resurgence in the last 20 years or so of Hawaiian culture and Hawaiian identity. More, more kids speaking 
Hawaiian and, and, and indigenous practices. These fish ponds are but one example. Um, and that, and, and he attributed to, which is, which is interesting, I had not heard that thought before, which was the, the decline of the plantations. So sugarcane, pineapples. So my grandma worked in a pineapple cannery um, when she was younger. Um, and uh, that culture was, was very much, it was very, in a sense, very similar to what was happening in the South. Not with slavery per se, but with uh, essentially indentured servitude. Basically, you could never get out, a sharecropper kind of thing. You were sort of the poor folks and you kind of were always living in the company housing and buying food from the company store and stuff and it and it uh, helped foster sort of a permanent underclass those employees those laborers were typically um, uh, Hawaiian but also a lot of immigrant uh, folks from Japan from <coughs> excuse me, the Philippines stuff like that and that it was really this poly, this, this sort of multi-blending of cultures, which, which Hawaii has been for a while, like New Orleans and, and some of our other <coughs> communities. <coughs> sorry, 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 sorry. <coughs> anyway, with the, with the final cessation of those large plantations as a significant part of the Hawaiian economy, which basically the last ones pretty much died out in the late 80s or so, there's been, um, if you will, more an ability of the Hawaiian culture to reemerge as opposed to, and not that, so what Greg is saying is you go around, there's, there's Thai food and there's, there's all these different cuisines, which is cool, which is totally cool. And that, that comes from this mixing of the cultures, right? Um, helped, driven in large part by the plantations needing cheap labor. But as that sort of is, you know, has fallen away, this notion of hey let's let's re recover our Hawaiian identity. Um, so when we when we flew back on the airplane, for example, this morning, um, instead of someone speaking and then having Spanish subtitles, people were speaking and then it was Hawaiian subtitles, right? Or they would speak in Hawaiian, there'd be English subtitles. You never saw that 20 years ago. You would never see that, right? But it's it's more this like honoring the language, honoring the culture, honoring the people, which is which is kind of cool. Um, anything else about the night market you guys want to chime in on? Okay, cool. Uh, the next day we went to Volcanoes National Park. Anybody want to talk about Volcanoes National Park? So that's that's uh, lava pit flowing in one of the calderas. We didn't, we didn't walk to a lava flow. That would have been a whole day just to do that. So we did other things. But we at least got to see this cool stuff. Uh, comments? Anybody? Any observations from volcanoes? Yeah. Did you see the heron that lived in the National Park? Uh-huh. Yeah, so cool stuff. A lot, lot of unique adaptations, a lot of critter, high endemism rate. Um, with uh, an endangerment rate with a lot of species on the islands. Anything else? Uh, I noticed that during the day, I was expecting there to be more people, but actually at night there was more people, I thought. Yeah, the daytime, this same thing you're looking at right now looks like, oh, this, this, this is everybody walking through a uh, lava tube. This is the thirst and lava tubes. Um, so this is a, we're not recently, but you know, who knows, a million years ago, whatever, uh, lava was flowing through. But, uh, oh, yeah, so I saw a big, huge explosion. Well, I did, everybody else was having lunch, but there's a big, huge explosion of lava. So that image was right. The image we were filming before, looking right at the base of that, uh, that was that was fairly unusual. I want to say that. So, so yeah. So that gives you a sense of scale as to what 
we were looking at right there. So this is in the daytime. Everybody checking it out. Um, we heard from a ranger about how they manage people. Um, and they have to have, and so every, normally when you go into outdoors, wilderness or whatever, <clears throat> the encouragement is to detach, right? Don't take electronics. One of the things they like to have, I, I was unclear if they required it or they just strongly recommended it, but I think they might have required it now. You have to have a cell phone with you when you're hiking out there in case, because a the, lot of the lower reaches, especially are within the tsunami zones. So if you're in the backcountry hiking here over these lava fields and there's an earthquake somewhere in the Pacific, these, the rangers need to be able to reach you quickly. And, and so cell phones are actually encouraged as a, as a way to have an emergency commu communication for a landscape that could become very dangerous super quickly. Um, we also heard about the dangers of walking across here. So in most national parks, if we go across, maybe we'll cause some erosion, Maybe we'll harm a plant. Here, if you, um, you know, go some areas where you're not supposed to be, you could just straight up die because you could your lungs can sear with this different gases, and basically you just essentially suffocate to death in a couple minutes. So, so it's a, it's it's not just managing people to protect the resource; it's managing people to protect the resource and to protect the people, which is a bit uh, a bit. It's uh, different than a lot of our stuff. Any other comments about Volcanoes National Park from you guys that went? I talked to some ranger and he said that not the, the outer edge of the rim right there, but kind of the inner one. Uh -huh. Yeah, right there. It's I guess that's 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Fahrenheit, you're yeah, right. Yeah. Right. I didn't think it was that hot, though. It was yeah. It's muy caliente. <laughs> yeah. Anything else? Any other comments? OK, cool. Uh, then let's see. Then the next day we went to. Uh, just next day we went to. Um, so this is everybody. Are you guys here? This is everybody crawling underneath this interpretive center uh, that is cooled by seawater. You're seeing there is seawater from 3,000 feet off the or below the surface been pumped up and it goes through these coils and then air is drawn in at regular atmospheric air hot warm tropical air goes around that the cold water cools the air and then the water and then the air excuse me moves up through the building so it's naturally air conditioned um, and so we were visiting this uh, place that began as the ocean uh, as an effort to use the thermal differences between the shallow ocean water temperature, which is 76 or so, and the deeper uh, down water that's colder, use that temperature differential, and uh, turn ammonia into steam, and then use that to turn turbines. And so uh, we, we talked about that. The energy production from it is still experimental. So they have a 100 megawatt plant. Um, they want a thousand megawatt plant. They have a hundred megawatt plant that works sometimes when they're just doing tests. So it's not a huge amount of electricity that's generated, but the, they're trying to show the potential for this. Turns out the biggest benefit right now is that they have this giant seawater system that sucks in cold water up to the surface. And so a huge number of mariculture operations have grown up around this facility. So we also toured, toured those. You guys want to talk about that at all? Say again? The cold soil farming is one of their important streams. It's growing Napa Valley Chardonnay grapes in a tropical region through like a cold soil process. Right. So, they, so just like they sort of ran the deep seawater through the air intake to cool the air, another guy's using the same thing to make the soil a little bit colder and more moist and stuff. So they were able to grow, grow things that were more temperate in the tropical climate. Yeah, it's too cool. Too cool for some things. And, and so we, we toured a, a farm, Kampachi Farms, that makes, um, that, that, that's working on growing fish. Again, more of an R&D type facility. 
and then a regular abalone farm, Big Island abalone, uh, that I'd say in many, many respects is, are not as sophisticated as our California farms from what I've seen, but nevertheless still a big, a big uh, abalone operation. Uh, they used to grow our abalone from California. Now they grow a similar species from uh, Japan. So we saw that. And, he, and then, uh, oh, we also went to, um, we also went here. So these are the students looking at um, Hawaiian monk seal rehab, a rehab facility. And so again, this is making use of that clean, cold water. And so we had a tour. <laughs> He's excited. He's excited. What can I say? I'm going to put a different picture up there. Look, now he's looking. Now everybody's paying attention. Um, anyway, so yeah, so we saw that. So that was cool. Um, endangered species, uh, 11, 1,100 is the most recent estimate. I think in one of my videos, somebody incorrectly says 1,300, but it's actually 1,100. Um, so not that many left. And before, before, Polyne before human arrival, before Polynesian arrival in the islands, there was only two mammals. There was a bat and there was this, and the, the, this uh, monk seal. Everything else was uh, birds or fish or insects, or whatever. Um, cool. Uh, what else we do? We went, uh, oh, then we heard from a, a gentleman that spoke about tourism in Hawaii. Uh, what else? We do? Oh, we went to a community garden. Anyone want to talk about our community garden? Name right there. Uh-huh. It, it means that you're so full that you just want to go to sleep. I thought that was a pretty cool name for community Right. Garden. It means basically satiated or totally full of turkey and you want to sleep on Thanksgiving kind of kind of term. This is a cool, this is a cool um, uh, garden and we heard about it uh, again, similar to the other ones, a lot of, a lot of stumbles, hard to get this stuff going uh, in a, what amounts to a, a not very wealthy rural community. Theft and people stealing stuff is, is a problem. Uh, but they're persevering and they're doing great. They just the day before we showed up, they had their first ever farmers market where they sold just about everything, and so that was cool. And this is this is a, a project of a bunch, many, many, many different groups, um, University of Hawaii Extension, <coughs> and other groups. Um, but it's pretty cool teaching people how to garden and grow their own, own food. <coughs> Tons and tons of trash, yeah. Yep. So I, well, I was going to say going off of that, um, I really, she works, the woman that was, what was her name? Chantal. She works with substance abuse as well, and she was really passionate about relating, like, healthy food to substance abuse and kind of how it can be, like, a, like a solution to that sort of problem in her community. And Right. So what we're talking about here is access. So equitability, cost effectiveness or affordability, all those things are key. And we, we do uh, this in New Orleans as well. Um, it's not directly a coastal management thing per se. It's more of a general, general management, general challenge. But um, using, uh, in this case, gardens, but you could use the same thing with, with sustainable fisheries and other things, right? 
if people have access to their own food source so they can gather their own food, food source so they can cultivate their own food source, they're going to tend to eat that and they're going to tend to be more healthy and have less disease and all that kind of, and all the other stuff that rolls along with that. And uh, if they and if they take care of stuff, a sense of self-worth, this issue with disempowerment, addiction to substances and things of that nature are minimized when we have more people engaged in these types of practices. Um, and then, of course, uh, she also used the term food sovereignty, which is not just not just food, which is cool and healthy food and affordable food, which is cool, but also tying into their Polynesian traditions, their Hawaiian traditions. So this particular thing was used for that. This was used for that. They have a macadamia nut tree there that they don't really want, but they leave it there because it's the first thing the kids come to and you and these guys went to. <laughs> and Greg's like, do you have a rock? Can I crack this macadamia nut? Um, and so, so it's a communal thing, right? It's a communal <laughs> thing of... of um, it's a communal thing of, of food. And that's an important part of culture as well. There you go, look, Greg's macadamia nut. <laughs> Yo. Uh, the, uh, Ma Ona, Ma Ona? The garden on their Facebook page, they put up uh, a post about us. What? You guys are on their Facebook page? You're blowing up. <laughs> cool. Special thanks. All right. We're blowing up social media. I love it. So uh, real quickly before we go on, I uh, just want, need to mention to everybody, this is Taro. This is taro. So this is one of the key foodstuffs for all of Polynesia. They prepare it slightly differently in different, uh, in different uh, areas of the Pacific. But basically, this is um, a plant. Uh, it can be grown in the upland. It can be grown in a more wetland uh, type of environment. Uh, I, I mostly think of it as a wetland plant. Um, but it doesn't have to be. Um, and it basically, uh, it, you take it, grind it up, mix it with some water, and that becomes the main starch, or one of the main starches that, that Hawaiian culinary stuff is built around. So from this is made poi, and so that's kind of like rice or bread to, to like, you know, Japanese or Italian culture or whatever. So very, very important, important uh, plant. Uh, anybody else want to say anything else about the community garden? They made us, they, they made us a pig that they cooked in their brand new emu, this underground oven, which is pretty cool for us. It was great. Any other comments? We learned a lot, but it was kind of a real good cultural experience I think we had that we actually lived instead of just talked about and heard about. Right. Uh, yeah, we did some other things too. Um, we did some beach surveys and this and that. We uh, talked about ecotourism. So this is just off of this one um, uh, high-end resort, Sheraton. And we're looking at, what you're looking at is a bunch of dive boats, an ecotourism operation to, and, and if you, if we go back, or if we go back, you can see, they each have these, there's a bunch of light out in the water. They're shining bright lights to attract big manta rays. So people can go sit there on scuba and watch these big fish swim past them or snorkel uh, just over them and stuff. And so um, potentially a great source of income. You don't hurt the animals. You're not, you're not chumming the waters per se or anything like that. The light is bringing the phototactic plankton to them, to, to those waters. And the manta rays are filter feeders are kind of just swimming through the bands of light to get food, basically. So in theory, it's not messing with anything too much. But have a look. This is, this is within, I mean, we didn't jump in the water because it was, couldn't really see what was going on. But in theory, if, it, if we knew what we were doing, we could have jumped in the water and swum there in maybe like 30 seconds, right? It's very, very close in. And right here we have 
one, two, three, four, five, six. You see in this picture, I think if we counted more like 10 or something at one point, folks all in there, right? And so, so you get to issues of, is this too many people? Is this safe? What? And so they're talking about now doing some type of permit process so that if you want to go out there, you have to do it. People have been doing this for decades and decades, but it's really only become a big thing, a big sort of commercial thing with lots of boats since about 2005. And so it's a relatively new uh, tourism item or, 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 or tourist thing. But uh, is that going on? Uh, yeah, I think that was the main things I wanted to touch on. Is there anything else you guys wanted to add or mention that we did on the trip or stuff you wanted to share outside of the blog? No. OK, great. So these guys that went on the trip, they're, they're doing some final blog posts. And then um, they are going to generate, uh, each of them, a, a short video about some aspect of the trip. And we'll show those when these guys finish that in, in a couple weeks.